Hey everybody, I'm Justin Shiner. And I'm Andrew King, and we're with the Department of Horticultural Sciences at Texas A&M University. And today we're gonna to talk muscadines. We're here in Nacogdoches, Texas at the Stephen F. Austin State University Arboretum. There's 30, 40, 50 different cult, uh, cultivars or varieties of muscadines. Yeah, we're gonna taste them, we're gonna talk about them, and we're gonna tell you how you can grow your own. And we're gonna be full. Let's do this. Muscadines. What exactly are muscadines? Muscadines are one of our native grapes. So we've got 13 native species here in Texas, and muscadines represents one that is native to East Texas, all the way up to Delaware, and it's been improved through breeding and selection, and now we have over 100 different named varieties. So if you're gonna grow a grape, why wouldn't you grow something like Thompson Seedless if you wanted a table grape, or Cabernet Sauvignon if you wanted a wine grape, or Concord if you wanted jelly? Here's a good example of why you may not select those grapes and why you may be better off growing a muscadine. We're in East Texas, it's humid, This, uh, especially uh, during the growing season, it's hot and it rains pretty frequently. So what do they average? 40 inches of rain or so here a year. What does that translate into? It translates into disease problems. So this is a white wine grape variety called Blanc de Bois. In Texas, this is our number one wine grape variety that's white produces white wine by acreage. So it's very popular, extremely high quality potential. So you can make excellent wine with this. However, it is not resistant to all diseases. And in this particular case, these vines right here, they haven't been sprayed with any sort of uh, protectant sprays, any fungicides. And they've got black rot and we have anthracnose here on the shoots. And so in an area like this, I actually see some downy mildew in there as well. So in this part of the state, these diseases right here are not only going to affect the foliage, it's going to take your crop as well. So if you wanted to grow this grape, you would have to get out and apply some protectant sprays. Now let's look at the muscadines directly across. These didn't get sprayed either, and if you look at the leaves, they're nice and clean. This was a shoot that was cut, which is why it's dead. Uh, but these leaves are nice and clean. We don't see any blemishes we don't see anything in the way of disease. The reason is, is because muscadines, being a, a native, have excellent disease resistance in the leaves and in the fruit. So if you're gonna grow these in your backyard, you could get by without spraying anything to prevent pests or disease. Commercially, you know, you're gonna get some losses um, from some fruit rots and things like that, maybe great berry moth. So you would wanna make probably some applications. Good news is, is you could grow those organic if you wanted to. Muscadines represent probably the best grape option for us in Texas as far as growing with organic practices. So let's talk a little bit more about the different muscadine varieties. All right, so you wanna grow muscadines, but what variety or varieties should you grow? There's quite a few out there to choose from. Well, there's a number of different criteria depending on what your purpose is for the muscadine. If you're only gonna have one single vine, you only have space for one, you have to make sure that it's a self-fertile variety. So in the wild, muscadines are dioecious. The plants are either male or female, and that's true with our other wild grapes. So a lot of the grapes that we see grown in the woods never produce any fruit because they're male vines, they only produce pollen, and the female vines are the ones that bear. So grapes are primarily wind pollinated, so the pollen blows in from the male vines and pollinates the flower. There are varieties of muscadines, however, that pollinate themselves. This variety that we're looking at is called Supreme. It's a female variety. So if you wanted to grow this grape, you need a self-fertile variety in pretty close proximity. Typically, we're talking about 30 feet or so. What's another feature that you may be looking for in a muscadine to help you select? Well, what color do you like? Do you prefer bronze or do you prefer black. There are also some varieties that have more of a pink reddish type of color as well. This is probably more important if we're talking about um, selling grapes, so retail sales. Another feature that you may consider is a wet stem scar or a dry stem scar. So what are we talking about here? Well let's take a look. So when you pick your grapes they'll either have a dry stem scar where the point where it attached to the cluster it's dry so there's no opening towards the interior of the barrier. Some varieties are more prone 
to have wet stem scars. So that can either be a tear in the flesh or that could be a hole that perforates all the way through inside the berry. So what does that do? Well, that reduces the shelf life of these berries to a very short period of time. In your backyard, that may be perfectly okay or maybe the U-pick operation or something like that. But if you were gonna try to store these grapes, that would reduce the shelf life. So if you have this muscadine vine in your backyard, you get 40 pounds of fruit uh, over a fairly short period of time. You wanna hold on to it as long as you can. How do you store it? Well, you're gonna store it in the refrigerator. What I would do is I would lay the berries out on the counter, sort out all the ones that have a wet stem scar, you're gonna eat those first. And then the ones that have a dry stem scar, you can go ahead and put those back in the refrigerator. So you can either put them in a sealed bag and you're probably gonna have some condensate in there, which um, can cause some rot over the long term or you can store them in something that breeds a little bit. You could leave the bag open. If you've ever noticed, if you look at fruit in the store like blackberries uh, in those little clamshell packets, you'll see that there are slits or opening inside of those containers to allow them to breathe and to prevent water from building up because you throw these hot muscadines in the refrigerator in a bag, what you're gonna have is condensate form on the inside of the bag and it's gonna reduce the shelf life. What else are you gonna look for in your muscadine variety? You're gonna look for size. So this is Supreme right here. Supreme is a female, like we said, and it is perhaps the largest fruited muscadine. This is not an exceptionally large berry I just picked, uh, but they can get up to the size of about almost a ping pong ball, about an inch and a half in diameter. There's a handful of varieties that are pretty close to this size, and there are some varieties that are substantially smaller. So in the wild, the berries are gonna be quite a bit smaller. So there's some really large muscadines. Another feature that you may look for when you're selecting a muscadine is flavor. There's a whole range of flavors out there. If you've tasted mu one muscadine, you surely haven't tasted them all because they all taste different. So some varieties like Supreme have better fresh eating characteristics. So pick it off the vine and eat it, it tastes good. Maybe the skin is thinner and crunchy and edible. Um, higher sugar content, things like that. There are also processing varieties that are primarily used for wine and juice. Those varieties tend to be smaller and often they'll have tough skin or maybe the skin will have tannins in there and it'll, it'll give it some astringency. So you wanna make sure that you're getting a fresh eating variety if that's your intended goal. And now if you're thinking about having more than one muscadine vine, you've got room for a handful in your yard. You can pick varieties that ripen at different timings. So there are varieties that are considered to be early ripening. Um, typically we're talking about July, August, early August ripening period. A lot of the bronze varieties tend to be fairly early. There's a new variety called Lane that is uh, an early black fruiting variety. And then there are varieties that are considered to be, you know, mid-season, late season, and then even very late. There's some varieties like Granny Val that are very late, and you may pick those through September, even into October. So if you were gonna have three or four vines in your yard, you could have some red or some black, you could have some bronze. You could be picking them over a few month period of time. There are also varieties out there that ripen synchronously. So the whole vine tends to ripen at once. And if you were growing them commercially and trying to harvest efficiently, that's what you would want. Uh, and then there are varieties that ripen very unevenly. So as you can see, Supreme here does not ripen totally evenly. You can see some of these berries are still green. Whereas on this cluster, there are berries that are already black. So you're not gonna pick this fruit at one, one time. There's a variety called Nesbit, which I'm a big fan of, and it ripens over about three to four week period of time. So even with that one single variety, you can be picking fruit for literally a month. And that's great for the backyard, maybe even a U-pick operation. Dr. King, you're from Tenahaw. Yeah. East Texas, so you know muscadine grapes. I do. Most people don't. Yeah, so most people think that they've had a muscadine uh, probably 80% of the classes that I've had I say, have you had a muscadine? They say, yes, I hate those things. That's always my first clue that they maybe haven't had a muscadine. Maybe somebody hates them, I don't know. But uh, most of the time those people have had what we know as Mustang grapes. These tiny or smaller than the muscadine, little grapes out there in the, in the wild, in the forest and things that nature, and they're very tart and they're just, they aren't very good, quite honestly, not at, least, at least not to eat fresh. Yeah, and if you want to know, is it a muscadine or is it a mustang grape, two different species, look at the leaves. Muscadine grape, nice and green, not hairy, front and back, not much in the way of hair. 
Whereas a Mustang grape, the shoot tips will be silverish. The leaves will look silver, especially on the undersides because they have so much pubescence or hair. That is the Mustang grape. We see Muscadine grapes in their native range. Most of them are gonna be uh, east of Interstate 45 all the way up into Delaware. So East Texas, where rainfall is higher, soils tend to be more on the acid side, lower pH, than further west. So if you know the Muscadine grape and you're from East Texas, you've probably seen it maybe growing up the trees. Maybe you've seen that little pile of grapes on the ground uh, where yeah. the, the coons or something got in there and was, was eating them. Or he and I. Whatever. Or us. <laughs> We've been known to climb a tree or shake a vine here and there. <laughs> So what happens with muscadine grapes is they produce small clusters of large berries and when they get fully ripe, they'll actually fall off the cluster and fall to the ground. And so if you're familiar with those wild muscadines, good news, whether you like them or not, they have been improved dramatically through breeding and selection. So what's the knock on these guys? Uh, really thick skin? Thick skin. And uh, seed. So in order to really eat this, most people, at least the older muscadines for sure, are gonna chomp into this thing, split the skin, and then need to split the flesh again to be able to spit the seed out. Unless you're, you mentioned like your son, mm -hmm. who will actually eat the seed, which is, he's, he's apparently a tough dude. Well, there's some nutrients in the seed, but the seeds are bitter and they tend to be fairly hard with muscadine grapes and for some people that is a complete deal breaker they think grapes should be seedless naturally um, you know that doesn't occur naturally and because muscadine grapes have only been bred for about 100 years now we are just getting our first seedless varieties and so the deal is with muscadines versus all of our other grapes is they're different so they're genetically different and they're physiologically or their structure their function is different to the point where you can't really cross very easily at all a muscadine grape would say Thompson seedless and then get some seedless fruit. You have to cross the muscadines with muscadines for the most part, um, and that makes the process a little bit slower. But as you said, muscadines have this thick skin. Most varieties are seeded. With breeding, what, what we've done, or they have done, the breeders, is they've increased the berry size to the point to about the size of a ping pong ball, with the largest, absolute largest varieties. Higher sugar content, as high as any table grape you can get at the store. Uh, we said we said seedless is now. The skin has gotten thinned out. Some varieties have a really crunchy skin. I mean, it's almost as crunchy as celery. Yeah, so the texture actually sort of makes up for some of the thickness. If the texture is really uh, crisp, it doesn't. Uh, per, we don't perceive it as that thick. And they're just so different than the table grapes people are used to. Yeah. That's why some people object to them. Flavor's different. <clears throat> quality's different. Texture's different. Some people have described them, I guess, as musky, which I think is sort of. They just have muscadine in the mind so that they're going to say that, but they're delicious. I feel like my dad went around, anytime these things were ripe, he always was eating the muscadine. Well, and, and if, you know, there's some percentage of the population that doesn't like muscadines. I give them to my class most semesters, and uh, about 15 or 20 percent of people don't like the flavor or the seeds or something like that, and they just say they don't like any of the varieties. But the other 80 percent, or 85% find a variety of varieties that they like and there's always people waiting after class because they absolutely love them and they say where do I get these things and the answer is you either find a vineyard yeah. that does a you pick or sells them locally or you grow your own Grow your own we don't really have a, a retail market much to speak of for muscadine grapes here in Texas really it's concentrated in the southeast you can find them in North Carolina and Georgia uh, that sell them in clamshells and things like that. But even there, it's hard to get traction in the market because these fruit are unique. But you can grow these, and you can grow them with really not a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And so, especially if you're in the right spot, I yeah. mean, if you're in East Texas, for sure. Yeah, and there are other fruit like that that we can grow with uh, really not a lot of effort. That we don't have a commercial market here in the U.S., but there's a commercial market elsewhere in the world. So jujubes, for example, Asian persimmons would be another good example. Pineapple guava, um, we could probably name a few more. Now, let's talk a little bit about that thick skin. Mm -hmm. So the thick skin, whether you like it or not, serves as an excellent barrier you know, to prevent pests and disease problems. And the skin is thick, and if you squeeze the grape, and this is how some people eat them, we call it a slip skin. You squeeze it, the pulp actually pops out and separates from the skin. You can see how it separated 
very easily. So slip skin. Some people eat the pulp and throw the skin down, but that's a waste. Most of the new varieties, the skin is actually quite edible. There you go. You know, my wife tells me to grow a thicker skin all the time. I wonder if this would suffice. I like it. All right, so now it's time for the tasting. Tasting on the tailgate. It's hot, but the sun has gone down. Hopefully the noise in the background is not too bad. This is probably when we should have started. You're right, you're right. So what we've done here is we've picked um, just about every variety. We're not gonna taste them all. No folks, we didn't taste them all, but we did taste over 30 varieties of muscadines. Now this is a great opportunity, or should I call it a great responsibility. Were they delicious? Yes. Should you eat that many muscadines at one time? No. Nonetheless, here are some of our more interesting findings. Supreme is large, so Supreme can get up to about an inch and a half in diameter. Uh, it is one of the most popular fresh eating muscadines. We hastily harvested these. So this one- You would... hastily harvested. I harvest it with love and affection. All right, let's try this. Mine is not that ripe. It's hard because the muscadine is all ripe and it's slightly different time. Crunchy skin. Much more edible. I feel like the skin is much more edible. So mine wasn't extremely ripe. I think it was more ripe than yours, I would guess. Mm -hmm. So here we go into one of our issues is that if he gets a ripe one and I don't, I'm going to think this tastes like not good and he t this tastes... Mm -hmm. But when it comes to muscadine, some people like them more yeah. ripe. Me, I prefer mine to the point where they're as ripe as they're going to get before they start to raisin. And even if they raisin a little bit, that's fine. I like the acid to be low because the acid decreases with ripening and the sugar, of course, increases. So I like them sweet where they taste like candy. But it was much more pleasant to me. The skin was pretty crispy, pretty crunchy, I guess is the better way to say it, which makes it, even if it is a little bit thick, it's a lot more edible. And then you get into that flesh, not overly sweet, but good muscadine flavor. I mean, that, I know that's kind of silly, but it, it, I think it's traditional. Good enough. All right, <clears throat> fry. Excellent flavor. This has got good full muscadine flavor, which is fruity, it's aromatic, a hint of like a concord, but with maybe some candy, like, we'll say cotton candy, with something aromatic. Mine was similar to that, um, to our last uh, A little bit similar to Supreme. Just again, just bursting, crisp, it was refreshing. Scarlet, Scarlet's a little bit more oblong than the others yeah. that we've had so far. A little smaller, it's got this reddish tint to the skin. Um, some consumers don't like that darkening color. So some varieties, you know, once they hang for a while and they start to darken, that's a, that's a problem. And so they're picked before they actually will start to turn that dark color. Scarlet being one of them, uh, Triumph even, or Terra, those can darken as well. Like those guys on the cooking show, cheers. Low acid in mine. Mm. Low acid, but not really high sugar. Not really sweet. So it's got a bit. It's got a little bit of creaminess in the flesh. It's almost a little bit. Me think I'm crazy. Almost pick up a little hint of banana. I would. I would agree. Yeah. So, there's some strange. There's some interesting flavors yeah. going on in that. Nesbit. All right, Nesbit, self fertile, ripens over a long period of time. Good backyard grape. I've got it in my backyard. Uh, it's one of my favorites. My only problem, and I hate to say this before you taste it, is skin is kind of thick and kind of leathery. There you go. I have, to, I have to say I might have to eat my own words, no pun intended, because the skin on that one, I chewed it and it went into small pieces, yeah. and it was actually fairly soft. Yeah, I didn't get much thick skin there. I like that. It had a good bit of acid in there. It wasn't, again, mine wasn't really all that sweet. 
but it was as muscadiny as fry. Muscadiny is not a word, but it is now as fry to me, and it met, it met all my traditional muscadine needs. All right, so we've got the two most popular wine or processing type muscadines. And as you can see, they're very large. <laughs> so we've got Noble, the black, for red wine, and we have Carlos. You want to hold the Carlos up? I do. I want to make sure that the camera doesn't get hit by that car right there. So there's a, there's a Carlos. Not very big. Okay. All right. Even smaller. Yes. So small. Um, ripens fairly evenly. And if you're going to make wine, you want to be able to come in and pick a lot of this because it's a small berry, not a lot of juice. So you want to pick a lot at one time for efficiency. And then you go through and, of course, make wine. And this makes a very red wine. And this is the standard. And on a side note, muscadine wine, um, red wine's healthy in general, in moderation, a glass a day. Muscadines actually have higher phenolics, in particular resveratrol, which is one of the compounds associated with uh, cardiovascular health. Muscadines have higher resveratrol than all other grapes. Carlos has been around a long time. You can find Carlos for sale all over the place. A lot of people grow it and they, as their fresh eating muscadine, it's a processor. You can eat it fresh, but the skin is, I won't say shoe leather. It's just this side of shoe leather. Okay. The skin is shoe leather. The flesh is a strange sort of, mine was at least had some kind of mucilaginous texture. Did you might have some pineapple flavor. Maybe I a thought. little bit. I wouldn't say this is great. I, w I would not encourage our viewers to run out and use Carlos as a fresh. I mean, for one, have at it. That's what it's for. Albemarle, which is, okay, again, spoiler alert, one of the thickest skins <laughs> that we are going to see. <laughs> we picked this one because <laughs> the skin is so thick, it really stood out. <laughs> You want to make sure you have your dentures glued in very well when you eat this one. It's light. You know we said just this side of shoe leather a while ago? That's the other side of shoe leather. Not a fan. Alright, so we've got Southern Home. Interspecific hybrid. Interspecific hybrid. It's one of the few uh, grapes, muscadine grapes, I should say, that has been crossed with other grape species. Difficult too. Most of the time, uh, you end up with uh, something that's sterile, or the, the cross just generally is not successful. It's beautiful. The vine's beautiful. Yep. The leaves look different than all the other muscadines. More lobed. More lobed. So you could grow it. It's attractive. Um, we actually have some muscadine trials across Texas and this one we have in a location in Collin County the master gardeners there they have a vineyard and they were kind enough to trial some different grapes their soil is alkaline 8.3 pH Houston Blackland it's amended with compost compared to the other muscadines this one does much better so if you needed that muscadine flavor and you're probably not in the best location this is probably your choice when it's really ripe it has a coconut flavor I don't think this stuff is really ripe let's try it Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little vanilla mm -hmm. As far as flavor goes, that's my second. So It, it got ripped out. Southern Home, I mean, for me, it doesn't have great texture, but it has an incredible flavor. I think its spot is those, those people that probably their soil is probably not great for muscadines. Your pH is maybe 7, maybe 7.5. Um, you probably still need to throw some compost in there and amend it, but Southern Home is probably your best bet. Alright, so we're going to move on to a couple of new releases. New-ish, I should say. All fairly large. Not huge, but right there on the, would you say, moderate large? 2014 release, it's self-fertile, 
obviously it's a bronze. We've got Lane here, a 2012 release. It's so fertile and it is an early black fruiting variety. All right, what are we going with? Mm. All right, Lane first. Mm. Right off the bat, the initial flavor, I really like. Some pleasant sweetness, a little bit of freshness. The fruit flavor is very good. Yeah, I'm not picking up any. The pulp, the pulp has a, it's not as quite it's soft. Kind of it's kind of meaty, it's kind of meaty, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's not a bad thing. No. In fact, it makes it easier to get the seeds out. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, I give that one a thumbs up. I'm high on, what is this? That was Lane. Lane, yeah, I'm high on. And it's early, like you said, so, I mean, it, almost all of the Lane over here are ripe, or close to ripe. Yeah. As opposed to the other blacks that are not. So it's it's ripe. Um, things like uh, Triumph and Terra are ripe right now as well. Bronze. In general, most of the time, uh, there are a lot more bronze ripe early than there are black fruit. All right, Paul. Mm. 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 I just got some floral characteristics, like some Riesling wine. So I taste the passion fruit. That's my favorite of everything we tasted so far. That's crazy. Oh, cause, cause, okay, spoiler alert. We ate a lot of muscadines over here. So much that they all ran together, but now that we're kind of seeing them separate, Paul is up on top as far as the flavors. It was excellent. Very good. Good aromatics. And I still have it. I still have the- Yeah, yeah, a lot of them disappear aromatics. quickly. Yeah, I agree. Hmm, interesting. I'm gonna record you, okay? He's recording. Let's do this. Do this? Let's do this. This is my little boy, Aubrey. He's gonna try his oh. first muscadine. Here, just bite right into it. This sugar game. Mm. Tell us what you think. Does it taste good or does it taste bad? It tastes bad. Now you try it. Mm, let's see. Here, put it in. Mm. Mm -hmm. Give it a good bite. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Is it good or not? <laughs> All right. Apparently, there's an age. An age limit. So, how much fruit can a muscadine produce? Or, you know, how many vines do you need in your backyard? Well, this muscadine variety right here, uh, this is Jane Bell. It's a self-fertile variety. So it pollinizes itself. You could only have one vine and you would still get fruit. And it has a pretty large crop on it. So a muscadine vine, and this is very dependent upon the spacing, but you know, a typical situation, we'll say 10, 16 foot spacing, you can produce 40, 50, 60 pounds on a vine. And so if we're talking commercial production on a per acre basis, eight, 10, up to maybe 12 tons an acre uh, yield potential. So if you did have room for only one vine, you could get quite a bit of fruit off of it. And in fact, this vine may even be producing too much fruit. There are a few varieties out there that you have to worry about overcropping so they produce more fruit that they can fully ripen. Okay, so this variety Jane Bell is an older variety. Um, its berries are uh, medium to really on the small side. It's a bronze fruited variety. So when the fruit is ripe, it'll have, the skin will have a bronze color. And it's got pretty good flavor, but it has a thick skin. A lot of the older varieties have thick skin or have a really astringent skin. So when I say astringent, I mean if you eat it, it's gonna taste uh, bitter. It's gonna leave you with a rough, drying, puckering sensation in your mouth, like strong tea or black coffee. A lot of the newer varieties, they don't have that. The skin is thinner, maybe it's crunchier, and it doesn't have the bitterness. So when you're selecting varieties, I would suggest that you go with something that's on the newer side. So released in the past couple of decades, or maybe 25 years or so. Those varieties tend to have much better flavor characteristics than the older varieties of muscadines. All right, so 
you've got these muscadines or maybe your neighbor has some muscadines and you really like them but uh, you can't find them perhaps or maybe you're just in a spot that you're just really interested in having a uh, backyard project let's propagate some all right so muscadines uh, are typically propagated by way of softwood cuttings you say what's a softwood cutting well most of the time if I see a stem that is green all right that gets, is my first clue but then I'll take the actual stem itself and I'll begin to bend it some and if it bends a little at least and will return back to its original state I consider that to be a softwood uh, cutting you can kind of notice on this stem right here you've got a lot of that soft wood maybe 18 inches of it or so and then you'll notice as you move into it uh, the stem a little bit more toward the canopy you begin to see a whole lot of this uh, tan color all right a lot more of the lenticels on the actual bark that are showing i would consider this to be semi hardwood all right and actually i would consider this entire stem to be semi hardwood all right so semi hardwood and softwood and hardwood are all sort of relative terms uh, they all do a fairly good job of describing what they are so softwood is truly the softest material but semi hardwood is a uh, piece of the stem that is uh, relatively new growth typically less than a year but it's been through enough um, it may be it could be two seasons old but it's been through enough of the uh, uh, weathering process where it becomes lignified all right and that's sort of uh, shown by this tan color and then again it's much harder than than the softwood material is now after this goes through a winter all of this material that is uh, still here next year will be considered hardwood material and if you were growing uh, or propagating table grapes or wine grapes you typically propagate them by way of hardwood cuttings and there's reasons for that because that's typically when they're um, pruned table grapes and wine grapes also propagate fairly well from softwood cuttings but for muscadines that's not an issue we have a lot of softwood materials if you got a neighbor make sure you ask them first uh, but and if they'll give you some cuttings you can easily do this what I would do is I would take not the very freshest material that's a bit too green all right too soft if you will but I would take material like this right here all right so you've got a node here a node here a node is where the leaf meets the stem but you already know that I'm sure uh, all right so you take one of these the, the uh, basal leaf off the leaf that's the closest to the bottom of the cutting all right and then I would cut this at an angle all right and that thing's ready to go you can use some rooting hormone some oxen if you'd like to typically find that at a hardware store or a nursery if you want to I cut the tendrils off because it's just a, a modified leaf and it's going to sit there and just kind of get in the way so three to four inches long put this in a nice uh, if you've got perlite it, it can be that it can be peat it can be it can be soil from your backyard technically as long as it's clean the issue with that is is that you could easily get into some diseases and things so if, if you at all have the ability to go to your nursery go to your local hardware store and buy some peat or some peat based soilless substrate and stick this in there put a if you've got a, a little greenhouse that's great but if you don't make your own take a two liter coke, uh, coke bottle or whatever uh, your favorite uh, soft drink is and uh, cut the very bottom of it out put it over these cuttings and that will keep it nice and humid uh, probably spritz it with water every day or two if especially if it's up in a, uh, a kitchen window and you'll have roots on this thing in what three three four weeks something like that and that plant will be ready to go the only thing you have to be careful about when you're propagating your own material is that the material is legally something you can propagate that's the way that the breeder and the patenting company typically make some money off of the thing and you can't blame them for that so with that being said make sure that the material you're wanting to propagate is something you can legally propagate and uh, you'll be in good shape okay so we're looking at muscadines and uh, you know we happened upon this this fine specimen right here as you can see it started to grow in the spring had a canopy and then it collapsed all of a sudden 
So this tells me there's a trunk or a root problem. And if we really inspected this, what we would see, this one has vertical cracks all down the trunk. And so this one probably was injured during the winter time. And so muscadines, they're cold hardy. Typically we think about zone seven and you can get damage when you start to get often down into the teens, but it really depends on the weather that you had beforehand. So if you're in the northern, northeastern part of Texas and you wanna grow muscadines, you need to do your homework and see if that variety is particularly cold tender or not. You're gonna to wanna to go for some of the varieties that have a little better cold resistance. And that information's out there. Okay, so we're looking at a bronze variety here. This happens to be a Triumph. And what I wanted to point out here is that some of these berries have rot. Like this berry right here, this is gonna rot and it's gonna fall off. We've got a rotten berry right here. It already just slipped off. Uh, you can see here's another one right here that just fell off as well. So muscadines aren't totally bulletproof. And what we'll see is that there is variability in disease susceptibility across the different varieties. So in other words, some varieties tend to be a little more prone to rot than others. And that information's out there. So if you wanted one that had excellent disease resistance, you can, you can do a little homework before you pick the variety and make sure. Bronze varieties show blemishes, uh, obviously a lot more than the black varieties because that black skin uh, will hide some of those blemishes. Uh, also, there's something called grape berry moth that uh, infests all grapes, muscadines and our other wild species and our domesticated grapes as well. And this particular moth lays its eggs on the outside of the berry. Little larvae, little caterpillar emerges, burrows into the berry and rots the berry. And so this is pretty easily controlled with something like BT or some other sort of, uh, some other insecticide. All right, so you wanna grow muscadines in your backyard. Uh, pretty simple. So as far as growing requirements go for muscadines, it's gonna be very similar to your other fruit trees where you want full sun. When I say full, I'm talking six to eight hours a day. Uh, you know, best case scenario would be a muscadine out in the middle of an open field where it gets sun all day long. You see them growing in the woods, they'll grow like that. You're gonna get far more fruit out in the full sun. Number two, you want well-drained soil. What does that mean? Well, it's easier to say what it's not. Well-drained soils uh, don't stand in water. So if you have a soil that you get a heavy rain and you see water on the surface for a few days, that's poor internal drainage. The water doesn't drain through the soil well. Very few fruit trees and fruit crops will tolerate those conditions. The roots will rot and they'll die. You can also have slow internal drainage where say, you know, you dig a hole one, one foot, two foot down and what you do is you hit standing water. Well, the roots aren't gonna grow any deeper than that as well. So just about all of our fruit crops require well-drained soil. What do you do if you're in that scenario? You've got really heavy clay, drains really slow. The best thing you can do is berm it up. So you raise the soil where you plant the vine. It's very similar to a garden row where if you elevate the soil, it encourages drainage. So if you had really poor drainage, you may want to elevate the soil a foot, maybe even two feet up off the ground. Come in there with a couple of uh, loads, you know, with something like a wheelbarrow, dump it, form a nice planting bed. You can see that here where the soil has been raised to encourage drainage. So we want full sun, we want well-drained soils. What kind of soils do muscadines grow in? They'll grow in a pretty wide range of soil types so long as the pH is below seven. So we're talking about acidic soils. That's what they like. What happens if you grow them in higher pH soils? Well, you're gonna get some nutrient deficiencies. So we, we can look right here. These vines have iron deficiency. These are growing in our vineyard in College Station, Texas, where the soil pH is 8.2. Iron deficiency shows up as yellowing in the shoot tips, and then it extends down the shoot. So that's iron deficiency. That is a product of having soil that with a pH that's too high. You'll see that in some other fruit crops as well. So that's the main issue when it comes to muscadines is we want acidic soils, we want full sun, and we want the soils to be well-drained. All right, so if you wanna start a muscadine vineyard, you know, what are your steps? The first step is to evaluate your potential site. You're gonna to wanna to test the soil. You're, you're gonna to wanna to take some soil samples that are representative of the entire planting area, send them in to one of our reputable labs, and they will give you uh, information on the soil characteristics. You can get things like texture, sand, silk, clay. Uh, you can get information on the chemical characteristics, which is extremely important. 
Muscadines prefer acid soils, so we want a pH of below seven. The ideal soil for muscadines is gonna be in the five and a half to six and a half pH range. You can also find out if your soil is deficient of any nutrients and you may be able to amend or add that before planting. Number two is you're gonna to wanna to look for your irrigation source. Are you gonna use well water or perhaps surface water? Even though we're in East Texas right now and it rains about 40 inches a year, it doesn't rain necessarily at the right time. So you're gonna to wanna to have irrigation for your vines. They may survive the summer without irrigation, but your production's gonna be lower and the berry size is going to be smaller. So figure out your irrigation source, take a water sample and send it in to a reputable lab and they will give you a chemical composition of your water. And so there are things to look for like salts and even boron that can be a problem uh, for vineyards. Grapes are moderately salt tolerant, but we wanna know that in advance because there are some sub aquifers in Texas that are saline. So the water is too salty to use for irrigations and it's gonna cause problems down the road. Okay, next you're gonna figure out what varieties you wanna grow. Are you growing these grapes for wine? You know, do you have a winery? Well, then you're probably gonna select varieties that have better wine making characteristics. Are you gonna do a you pick operation? Well, things like timing of harvest are gonna be important. You may wanna extend that harvest season as much as possible, or maybe you're gonna do the fresh market. And in that case, you may also wanna extend the market, or you may wanna time it uh, to hit some part of the market or maybe uh, some sort of sale that you're gonna to go to like a farmer's market. So there's a pretty wide range in the ripening dates for varieties. You're gonna, of course, secure your plants. Muscadines are propagated from softwood cuttings, uh, which means they're really not quite as easy to propagate as a lot of the other grapes. And often the plants tend to be a little more expensive. So you're gonna order these plants and they make, they'll probably come in as a dormant bare root grapevine. You can also get potted vines with green leaves. Uh, either way, you're gonna to wanna to plant these early in the spring before it starts to get hot and starts to get dry. So you're gonna to wanna to make plans for your vineyard uh, a solid year in advance so that you can get your site prepared, you can get your vines ordered, and so that your vineyard will be ready to plant in spring. All right, well, we hope you learned something about muscadines today. Uh, it's getting dark. We still have a lot of muscadines to eat. So we'll see you next time.